Increasing numbers of people in the public sphere are calling themselves classical liberals. What exactly does this mean? In this video, I seek to provide you with a general guide to understanding the history and ideas embodied by this phrase. It is not a straightforward story, and there are many twists and turns along the way. Before I begin, two caveats. First, you should not see this video as being in any way comprehensive, but rather as your gateway into learning about each of the thinkers I will discuss. I will be giving extremely compressed and condensed summaries of some very complex ideas. There is always more to say on any given thinker. Second, this guide is made with the assumption that ideas really matter and help to drive the events of history. I am not saying, however, that only ideas drive history. Both economic conditions and technology also play a role. Generally, in history, pointing to a single factor or cause is a mistake, and I'd encourage everyone to develop a holistic view of historical causation, which would take in uh, economic conditions, culture, technology, as well as the history of ideas. However, here, I am concerned exclusively with the history of ideas and will not have time to discuss wider contexts very much. Here is a map of the most important thinkers I will touch on in this video. At a glance, you will notice that they are all white and male. This is because most of these philosophical developments occurred primarily in three countries, the United Kingdom, France, and in its very inception, the United States of America. And all of these were predominantly white countries. They also took place before the emancipation of women. And rather than balk at the fact that they were all white and male and condemn the past, I would rather encourage the viewer instead to see these men as people who ultimately laid the foundations and created the conditions in which freedom and equal rights for women were made possible in the West. They also paved the path for the abolition of slavery for the first time anywhere in the world in any known civilization. To understand the sorts of ideas that led to classical liberalism, we must begin before it was ever a thing, in the Renaissance and with an unlikely thinker, Niccolo Machiavelli. Now, some might be thinking how this well-known champion of strong central government could be a forerunner of liberalism. The answer lies in three crucial insights. The first is articulated by Francis Bacon here, that we should write as men do, not as they ought to do. This makes Machiavelli the first explicitly anti-utopian thinker. It foregrounds a commitment to learning from the mistakes of history. The second is his pessimistic view of human nature, seeing it as fundamentally self-interested with an unlimited appetite. He thinks individual humans can become corrupted by power extremely easily. Incidentally, this is why Machiavelli favoured republics to monarchies. And the third is the idea of checks and balances, because a ruler who does not successfully balance these off against each other constantly risks overthrow. If you have not made the jump yourself, these ideas all have their heart in a radical notion of individual free will. Yet Machiavelli's instinct was to control this rather than to give it purchase and agency. Though Machiavelli was vilified for much of the 16th century, this way of thinking, which was a break with conventional Christian morality, had a long and enduring influence. Francis Bacon, for example, often taken to be the father of modern scientific method and frequently accused, wrongly as it turns out, of atheism, openly avowed Machiavelli as an influence. But again, this did not make him a liberal. In his unfinished utopian novel, New Atlantis, Bacon imagines a future in which scientists and technocrats have replaced priests and the enlightened experts run society for the good of everyone else. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Now, during his life, Francis Bacon acted as a patron for his friend Thomas Hobbes. Hobbes took Machiavelli's idea of the self-interested nature of individuals to its logical extreme end. Famously, he described life as nasty, brutish and short, 
and argued that without strong central authority, mankind would descend into a war where every man is the enemy of every man, also known as the state of nature. Since most people can't endure this for very long, they agree to enter into what he calls a social contract with sovereign authority, who can protect them from violence to ensure peace and security. Hobbes believed that humans were so corruptible that the total number of officials needed to be minimised, and this is one reason why in Leviathan he advocates for absolute monarchy. He argues that judges, for example, are bribed by their own interests. He argues that law has to appeal to absolute authority and nothing else, even going so far as to say that the king should be able to kill an innocent person for no reason at all. However, he argues, perhaps somewhat naively you might say, that in practice, diverse representations of the population in the court should keep the sovereign from becoming too cruel, too unfair or too arbitrary. Now, Given this, it may seem strange to think of Hobbes as a forerunner to liberalism, but think about his conception of humanity. It is strikingly individualist, and if you think about it, quite egalitarian, because in the state of nature, everyone has an equal shot, an equal opportunity, that is, of survival. Now, eagle-eyed viewers have probably spotted Spinoza here, and anyone with a passing knowledge of political philosophy will likely be screaming at their TV sets that he's got a red line rather than a blue line pointing to him. It is true that Spinoza is almost universally seen as a rationalist rather than an empiricist, but following Immanuel Kant, Jonathan Rubin, Matthew Stewart and others, I prefer to see him as a radical type of empiricist. Now, we need not worry about the reasons for this here, it is not important. What is important is that Spinoza saw freedom, as opposed to security or social order, as the ultimate aim of government. So whereas in Hobbes, liberty is generally a negative that must be kept in check, in Spinoza it is the supreme end of every individual. And the best political system to achieve this is not authoritarian government, but democracy. Making liberty itself the absolute ethical end of human life, Spinoza departs sharply from ancient thinkers like Aristotle, who did not see slavery, for example, as an evil. However, and this is why Spinoza is always called a rationalist, for Spinoza freedom can only come when reason conquers the passions absolutely. And since most people in most places will be ruled by the passion as opposed to reason, the number of free people will always be limited. So Spinoza is still someone before classical liberalism proper. That is born with our next thinker here, the man himself, John Locke, who played the key point of departure from Hobbes. Where Hobbes believed in the state of nature, Locke believed in tabula rasa, that is, the blank slate, which holds that we are primarily the product of our time and our place. In fact, Locke argued that far from being selfish or brutish, most men are peaceful and good because they have been raised by the values of the church. This makes him fundamentally optimistic about the future as opposed to pessimistic. This belief is one reason why, as well as being the father of classical liberalism, Locke is also the father of the belief that everyone in society should have the right to education. Before Locke, education was seen only as a class privilege of elites and as actively dangerous by some in society. Uh, but after him, the belief that every citizen should aspire to education became more widespread. Of course, Locke generally envisaged that education would be done by religious people with a commitment to virtue ethics, although he also advocated for the complete separation of church and state. This was based on his principle of toleration, that the state should have no power to compel people's religious beliefs, which is in some ways natural for someone writing after almost two centuries of religious upheaval that the Protestant Reformation brought with it. Burning people at the state because they aren't of the right religion is an obvious violation of liberty. Note that although Locke thought everyone should have an education and likely expected that education to be religious in nature, he did not have any expectation that the state should provide such an education. Instead, he argued that local parishes should set up their own schools and, for a small fee, local children of working poor people could learn to read and write 
develop a good work ethic and even turn a nice profit for the church. Everyone's a winner. Locke's entire theory of government rests on the notion of natural law or natural rights, which ultimately rest on the authority of God. Unlike Machiavelli, Hobbes or Spinoza, who were all thinkers who had departed radically from the Christian church, Locke's ideas were firmly grounded in that tradition. These natural rights embody the conditions we need in order to protect and preserve our lives under the natural laws given to us by God. So what are these rights? The first one is absolutely crucial to virtually all strands of classical liberalism that follow, namely property rights, the right to acquire land and on which none may interfere since you own it. Another crucial right is the right of liberty. We have this right because we are God's property and therefore we may not alienate our liberty. For example, by entering into a contract of slavery or by committing suicide. So government for Locke must exist to protect our natural rights, that is property rights and the right to liberty. This means that the rule of law has to come above any given ruler. The potentially arbitrary absolute monarch advocated by Hobbes would too readily violate these rights, and so the powers of government need to be separated. So he separates legislative power, that is the power to wield force for the commonwealth and to make laws, and executive power, which is charged with enforcing the law, and then there is federative power, which today we'd simply call foreign policy, the question of how to deal with other nations. Now Locke is not saying that these powers should be separated in uh, three separate institutions or in three separate people. What he's saying is that they should be split across institutions. For example, to change a law might require three separate institutions, such as the King, the House of Commons and the House of Lords. And in order to change a law, all three have to agree to it and to sign to it. This is much more difficult than just the king or just one of the houses making the law. This would not be fully perfected into the now familiar form of executive, judicial and legislative branches until the French lawyer Montesquieu fully systematised them in 1748. Incidentally, a fascinating feature of Montesquieu and the separation of powers is that he was constantly wary of the tyranny of the masses or the tyranny of the majority and wanted to try to build safeguards against this. This was also a preoccupation of the American founding fathers, uh, the Federalists, especially James Madison, who in Federalist number 10 seeks to build a system of perpetually competing factions or special interests to ensure that a dominant majority can never form and create tyranny. He calls these cross-cutting cleavages. Incidentally, this is a screenshot from a fantastic series of lectures from uh, Yale University, and I've watched them all. Uh, I will link it in the show notes. It's about 25 hours of material, and it gives a lot more depth than what I can offer in this short guide. So we can see already how Locke's core ideas start a snowball effect as different thinkers from France and from America start seriously thinking about how to change their societies uh, to be more in line with Locke's vision. Now before I continue some of you might be balking at two things here. First is Locke's idea of the blank slate which after Darwin and in the light of subsequent modern evolutionary biology we know to be utterly untrue and second because of his commitment to theism which I imagine will be unpopular with some of you many of you watching this who will be atheists of course. Uh, these are both legitimate things to be concerned about if you want to maintain a classical liberal outlook. I cannot resolve this here, but it is worth bearing in mind, and it does need to be resolved. Now, I just mentioned that they were thinking of new ways of governing in France, and in fact, there was a revolution brewing there. Unlike Great Britain, which, despite the efforts of Stuart Kings, thwarted first by Oliver Cromwell and then by the glorious revolution of 1688, had never experienced anything like an absolute monarchy. France's various King Louis had achieved incredible centralised authority and immense personal power. 
This is one of many reasons why the revolution in France was so much more violent uh, than in Britain in 1688 or the American Declaration of Independence in 1777, and also why, despite the warnings of people like Montesquieu and Voltaire, it very quickly capitulated to tyranny and eventually the dictatorship of Napoleon. Another reason is the enduring influence of one Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who came from a skeptic rationalist tradition which argued from pure reason. One can draw a straight line directly from René Descartes and before him Montaigne, and then back to the likes of Sextus Empiricus and Piero of Elis and the academic skeptics of ancient Greece, thinkers committed first to radical doubt, uh, that is, the idea that one cannot trust one's own senses or observations as those foolish empiricists do, and then to pure reason. Rousseau is in many ways the polar opposite of Thomas Hobbes. Where Hobbes thought human nature is brutal, and the state of nature a state of perpetual war of all against all, which needs to be kept in check by authority, Rousseau thought that human nature is fundamentally good and innocent. The state of nature is that of the noble savage. And this clean bill of virtuousness comes to be corrupted by society and its bad institutions. He argues that the main reason this happens is because society creates artificial inequalities between men. In the state of nature, all men are made equal, but in society, men are not equal, and some are made dependent on or subservient to others. And Rousseau argues that the only way to fix this is to force what he called the general will to enforce a new social contract that will return us to the state of nature, that is, the equality of the noble savage. Now, it is not entirely clear what Rousseau means by the general will, is that simply majority opinion or something upon which everybody has to agree? Uh, in the opinion of his disciple uh, and one of the key thinkers of the French Revolution, Condorcet, it is chiefly that majority opinion rules. His jury theorem states that in a sufficiently large group, the majority opinion on a yes-no question is likely to be correct. Incidentally, Condorcet is also notable for being one of the first people to push for the rights of women. Anyway, both Rousseau and Condorcet believed in the perfectibility of man. Where education in Locke is mostly about the cultivation of a solid work ethic and good moral values, in Rousseau's radical version of the Enlightenment, reason alone can elevate mankind and there are virtually no limits to his potential. Hence the famous phrase, men are born free but everywhere in chains. To demonstrate the point further, here is Condorcet. And how admirably calculated is this view of the human race, emancipated from its chains, released alike from the dominion of chance as well as from that of the enemies of its progress, and advancing with a firm and indeviate step in the paths of truth to console the philosopher lamenting the errors, the flagrant acts of injustice, the crimes with which the earth is still polluted. It is the contemplation of this prospect that rewards him for all his efforts to assist the progress of reason and the establishment of liberty. He dares to regard these efforts as a part of the eternal chain of the destiny of mankind. So where Machiavelli and Hobbes are explicitly pessimistic and anti-utopian, Locke merely hopeful and optimistic about the future, Rousseau and Condorcet are fully utopian in believing humans can make changes so transformative that they will one day completely eliminate inequality, crime and injustice. Think about Star Trek, basically. That's where, that's where we're headed in their view. So already, by the end of the 18th century, we have the hard realism of Machiavelli and Hobbes, the moderate position of Locke and James Madison, and the utopian belief that we can one day do what's never been done before in history in Rousseau and Condorcet. 
There is an element of this radical utopianism in the American tradition found in thinkers such as Thomas Jefferson and Thomas Paine, especially the latter, who in both common sense and the rights of man considered so salacious that it was banned in Britain, creating an early instance of the Streisand effect, seems to expand the narrower set of rights outlined by Locke and seems to rely on abstract a priori ideas imported from Rousseau, such as this idea that man is born free and that the general will tends towards the public advantage. And it is not difficult to see how these three positions, realism, modernism and utopianism, are the forerunners of what would later become conservatism, liberalism and radicalism or socialism. One set of thinkers we need to mention in this regard are those of the so-called Scottish Enlightenment. Best friends for life, David Hume and Adam Smith, along with their buddy, although he was Irish, not Scottish, and notably a Catholic, Edmund Burke. All three of them critical of the British government's treatment of the American colonies. And alongside them, over in America, Alexander Hamilton and John Adams. Now, these are some very big thinkers who I can not deal with fully in this video. I will likely do a follow-up on the differences between classical liberalism and the conservative tradition at some point. But all of these thinkers are notable in sharing a more pessimistic view of humanity inherited from Machiavelli and Hobbes and in rejected the rationalism of Rousseau. They were all empiricists who thought that we should learn from experience and not push ahead with untested abstract ideas based on a priori reasoning. David Hume, for example, believed that it was folly to expect reason to tame the passions and that systems and hypotheses have perverted our natural understanding of morality. Think again on Machiavelli's key lesson, write as men do, not as they ought to do. Hume was truly a genius and developed theories I don't have the time to cover, with awesome names like Hume's Fork and Hume's Guillotine. Adam Smith, of course, is the father of modern economics, and laissez-faire quickly became the de facto economic principle of classical liberalism soon after, that is, minimal state interference in private enterprise or markets. Edmund Burke, the father of modern conservatism, who was an actual member of parliament and a very famous and respected politician in his own day, famous in America and France, was extremely critical of Rousseau, the French Revolution, and indeed had a bitter feud with Thomas Paine. The Rights of Man is in fact a reply to Burke's reflections on the revolution in France. But one of Burke's absolutely crucial ideas, one which arguably is part of the classical liberal tradition, as it is of modern conservatism, is his more generational view of the social contract. Society is indeed a contract. Subordinate contracts for objects of mere occasional interest may be dissolved at pleasure. But the state ought not to be considered as nothing better than a partnership agreement in a trade of pepper and coffee, calico or tobacco, or some other such low concern, to be taken up for a little temporary interest and to be dissolved by the fancy of the parties. It is to be looked on with other reverence because it is not a partnership in things subservient, only to the gross animal existence of a temporary and perishable nature. It is a partnership in all science, a partnership in all art, a partnership in every virtue and in all perfection. As the end of such a partnership cannot be obtained in many generations, it becomes a partnership not only between those who are living, but between those who are living, those who are dead, and those who are to be born. Each contract of each particular state is but a clause in the great primeval contract of eternal society, linking the lower with the higher natures, connecting the visible and invisible world, according to a fixed compact sanctioned by the invisible oath which holds all physical and all moral natures each in their appointed place. For Burke, institutions can't just be ripped up willy-nilly. He says it is the nature of despotism to abhor power held by any means but its own momentary pleasure. We might think of modern advocates of social justice who want to ban certain pronouns because it hurts their feelings. And this sort of Burkean thinking against the nature of despotism was very influential among the Federalists and is baked into the US Constitution. 
For example, here is James Madison in Federalist number 51. If men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. In framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed, and in the next place oblige it to control itself. A dependence on the people is, no doubt, the primary control on the government, but experience has taught mankind the necessity of auxiliary precautions. So, as we have seen, classical liberalism is not an easy thing to sum up, since there are all sorts of thinkers associated with it, and some of them disagree profoundly on some very fundamental issues. I think generally we can identify three broad areas that I'd characterize as conservative, moderate and radical. The conservative and the moderate positions are definitively Anglo-American in character, although it ha did have French admirers such as Alexander de Tocqueville. The radical tradition is avowedly French. The Anglo-American tradition generally tends towards an emphasis on property rights and small government, with robust checks and balances to ensure that the tyranny of the majority cannot occur and to ensure that any one special interest minority group cannot dominate. The French tradition, in contrast, gives itself over to the general will and has a much more radically egalitarian character. Now, in a future video, I hope to explain where all of this goes in the 19th century and the 20th century. The advent of utilitarianism after Jeremy Bentham and his protege, John Stuart Mill, and the revival of high Toryism and Romanticism, influenced by Edmund Burke, would see classical liberalism in a defensive posture flanked from the left and the right throughout the 1800s, and eventually by socialism and paternalistic big government conservatism, so-called One Nation Tories, in the 1900s. But that is for next time. I'd like to thank Son of Tiamat, Cult of the Lich, Tyson Powell, Ginger Bill, Charles Vinson, Edward Darra, Blake Barrows, and Nathan Pullum.